This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, part of the Seneca Network from SubChina. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, and does the name Pavlov ring a bell? My co-host is John Passon, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and corrects autocorrect more than it corrects him. Is Chinese really so hard? John and I are going to revisit this question and identify what really is hard about Chinese, what is now easier, and is Chinese really harder than other languages? Guest interviews with Sarah Kutalakos, a lifetime Chinese learner, executive director at the Canada-China Business Council, and all-round delightful person. All this and more, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hi guys, I'm John Pazden. I'm located in Shanghai, China. Hey guys, before we kick into our episode today, uh, just want to ask you if you're willing to take a moment, go write us a review, preferably on iTunes. Funny enough, even if you don't have an, uh, you're not listening to on iTunes, that's where most of those reviews get rated and helps us to be discovered in more places. Uh, so appreciate if you do that or write a review on whatever app you're listening to uh, and it'll find us or you can also shoot us an email at feedback at com. we'd love to hear from you guys and feel free to do that we'll give you a shout out here on the podcast yes thank you very much we really do appreciate those reviews and any kind of feedback you have we love it okay so today let's get right into it jared no more of this uh dilly dallying we want to get into today's topic because it is a burning question which uh, I hear discussed all the time. In fact, I just heard some people debating this very question last night. This question is, is Chinese hard to learn? Or the variation oh. is, how difficult is it to learn Chinese? Or, why is Chinese so hard? Yeah, so this comes up again and again. And then you see people being like, actually, Chinese is very easy. This is why. And then you, you see people being like, you know, like me, like, I think it is kind of hard. <laughs> I've been learning it for <laughs> decades. So uh, I think Jared uh, rightly reminded me of a classic article on this very topic. That's right. It's by Dr. David Moser, who was on episode eight. He wrote a famous article. Gosh, when was this, John? It was maybe 20 plus years ago. But it is, uh, it's titled, Why Chinese is So Damn Hard. Yes. Strong language warranted. So why don't we do a quick, uh, just a quick summary of his points, because it really is classic, and you should read the whole thing, but we just want you to know what he said. Now, mind you, these points are a little bit tongue-in-cheek. This, it's, it's kind of a bit of a humorous article, but uh, the points stand true. Yeah, this is actually a love letter, but it's a very strange love letter. All right, so Jared, can you give us that little summary? Right. So he goes through about nine different points, but really he, he says, like, hey, the writing system is ridiculously hard. The language that doesn't have an alphabet the writing system, it's not phonetic. You can't cheat by using cognates. And, and John, the linguist you are, how about you explain cognates to us? So languages um, are often very similar, either because they have common ancestors or because they've borrowed from each other. And so those cognates, either they're almost the same word in the different languages with maybe slightly different pronunciation, or they mean similar things. So we call those cognates. There you go. So there's no freebies, right? Then he goes on, he says, hey, Looking words up in the dictionary is complicated. And then there's classical Chinese. And then there's too many romanization methods like pinyin, and they all suck, he says. And then the tonal languages are weird and hard and difficult. And finally, because east is east and west is west, and the two have only recently met. So there we go. That's a theme we talk about a lot, about how you know the field of teaching Chinese is new, and there is much progress mm -hmm. to be made. I think one good place to start uh, with this conversation is just acknowledging the fact that the reason people have certain feelings about Chinese being difficult is often uh, based in a comparison. So, for example, an American, maybe in high school you studied Spanish, and so that gave you your idea of what a foreign language is and how much work is involved to learn it. And then you take on Chinese, and it's a little different from Spanish. And, and then, then all the comparisons come in, and you start saying things like Chinese is so hard. Yeah, that's right. And it's all your point of reference. But case in point, if your native language is like Japanese, 
uh, learning Chinese is actually going to be a little easier because you're now familiar with characters and uh, you know you're just you're right across the ocean right there you know, the ocean the strait right ah but the pronunciation is not going to be easy right yeah there you go so like I, I think I think it's very useful to to split the language just very broadly into two chunks the listening and speaking and the reading and writing and so like let's look at Spanish if you're if you're an American or another English speaker. I think in general, the pronunciation is not too bad. Some people struggle with it a bit, especially the R. And, um, and then the, the reading and writing are not too bad, right? And then like uh, an American like me when I first studied Japanese, the, um, the speaking in terms of pronunciation was not bad at all. Like I could, I could master the basic sounds. I could read something off a piece of paper and people would understand me. So nice. Now, the writing system, of course, with characters and kana, that, that's another story. That was hard for me. But the actual speaking, you know, making the sounds with my mouth, it was not hard. So then look at Chinese. The pronunciation, you know, the speaking aspect, you get smacked across the face with the tones and some difficult, you know, consonants and vowels right in the beginning. And without being able to pronounce those correctly, you can't be understood. While at the same time, if you try to find a refuge in, you know, the visual medium, you think, oh, writing and, you know, reading, that that won't be so bad. Then you have all the characters. You know, I've shared this story before, but I recall after I had been in China for a couple of years, I went on a trip to Barcelona, Spain for a conference. And, you know, it was ridiculous because I, I don't speak Spanish, right? But I could read signs on the road. <laughs> You know, <laughs> restaurante or whatever. You know, I'm like, oh, that's a restaurant. Agua. Oh, yeah. You know, and I... You know, it, rem it reminded me, you know, you go to China, you know, and I don't know the character. You got nothing, right? You could, it, you could guess, but, you know, you're especially at some sort of lower level, even intermediate level guessing, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty lucky if you get right. Yeah, so I think that's one reason Chinese gets a lot of flack for being difficult is that the reading and writing are super difficult right off the bat because there's nothing to help you, no, no frame of reference. And if you compare the amount of work it takes to be able to read Chinese to something like Spanish, then obviously Chinese is a lot more work and time. And then, you know, with pronunciation, you have the tones and the different sounds right in the beginning. So um, some people like to say, well, Chinese isn't hard. It's just, you know, you have to learn a bunch of things and they take time. And um, that's true. But if you compare how much you have to learn to just read a paragraph in Chinese compared to reading a paragraph in Spanish, like there's a very different workload involved there, right? Absolutely, because when we're looking at a language that uses, you know, our Phoenician alphabet, uh, you know, as long as you understand how the letters are pronounced and, you know, perhaps different combinations in that language, you can now, even if you don't know what you're saying, you could read in the language and probably be understood, maybe if you don't even understand everything you're saying yourself. But you at least you can read it. You can sound it out. You can give it a, uh, a audible representation of what it is. And so this is like one of the big challenges of Chinese, that you simply can't do that. You have to be able to know the character, um, and you have to know its pronunciation. You know, one thing I point out is there are those people who say, well, you know, if you learn enough of the radicals and the components, and I say, you know, components, actually, is that you should be, maybe you can guess the pronunciation. Maybe you can, but that's an advanced technique. And I always say this, even if you successfully guess the pronunciation, you're simply guessing on the tone because you, it, there's no indicator of what the tone might be for that. Although for some for some similar characters, the tones are pretty consistent. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that, that's the thing about Chinese. It's, it's very it's very difficult in the beginning. But then because you have no frame of reference, you know, it doesn't work like, you know, Spanish and English and French, these other languages. You have to start from scratch. You have to spend extra time and effort. But, if, and if you're still a beginner, you need to know this. But you get to like a certain critical point, both for the vocabulary and for the characters themselves, where... The system, like its internal structure, its internal mechanisms, they start to click. And mm -hmm. new things that you're learning reinforce old things. And old things help you learn new things, both for characters and vocabulary. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen for a while. Like for something like Spanish, you get the cognates right up in the beginning. But with Chinese, you have to stick with it for a while before you can benefit from that. Yeah, I think that's like a network effect where you have to hit critical mass 
you know, there, there are certain things like that. Once it gets big enough and it's going to be like a snowball that just kind of rolls down the hill. And I, I, I've experienced that as well in Chinese. But yeah, it takes a lot of time and a lot of experience with the language before you get to that point where it's like, oh, yeah, I can start connecting all the dots. It's not a beginner level. And it is, it's even intermediate. So it's a difficult, difficult thing to do. I think one other interesting aspect of this question is, um, despite the difficulty, you know, the upfront, you know, front-loaded work involved, some people love it and they don't mind it at all. And I think those people are the ones that don't want to call it hard. But like, uh, for example, characters. I'm one of these people, and I, I know other learners are like this too. The characters were never like this horrible burden. Uh, we never hated them. Uh, they were, in fact, one of the things that drew us to the language. Uh, when I first started studying Japanese, I liked the characters and I found them fascinating. And then when I bridged over to Chinese, I had a nice head start. But, you know, I found the Chinese characters fascinating as well. And so uh, th- that difficulty was kind of like a pro for me. You know, something about Chinese characters that, that had helped me in, in how I approach them and how I sometimes even think about them is that, uh, well, I'm t- the frame of reference on this is English that really once you get to a certain level in reading in your native language, and usually this is going to happen when you're a child, is that you stop reading the words letter by letter and sounding those out. You just kind of look at the word and then you know it. And so it becomes a sight word. And so, you know, there's perhaps you've seen little exercises like, like this on, you know, online somewhere where they'll take a word and they put, they put the uh, first letter and the last letter of the word there and they scramble up all the words, uh, all the letters in between. And if they do that, I mean, you can still read it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's kind of crazy. It's a little slower, but you're like, oh, yeah, you recognize it. Okay. So the, really, uh, you, I, I'm assuming everyone is listening to this is that your native language, you don't sound it out those words. They are sight words. And if you do come across a word you don't know, maybe you stop for a second and actually kind of try to pick it apart and dissect it and, and try to understand it that way. So I'm just pointing that out because in your native language, you are reading by sight. You're just, it's sight words. So you just instantly recognize them. Essentially, that's what we do with, with Chinese characters. I mean, that's how you have to do Chinese characters. It, it's, if there's a character that's difficult, you may stop. You may look at the different components and try to guess something. But for a fluent reader or if you're proficient in those characters that, you, that, are, that you're encountering, uh, they are equivalent to sight words where you just understand it. But you don't have that benefit of having the phonetic spelling in front of you all the time to sound out that character. And so you've got to move to a sight word more readily than you would in your native language that's based on the alphabet. Yeah, actually, some researchers have done studies on this. So, like, if you look at a language like English where it's, it's you know, kind of phonetic, the letters are spread out. It's kind of like how in Chinese you have all these strokes. Rather than going along the line, you're just, like, writing within this little square. So some characters will just be a couple strokes and some will be a whole bunch and it'll be really dense. So it's kind of like how in English we have long and short words and we have to just keep reading across. In Chinese, just the density varies from character to character. And that has a lot of really interesting implications about things like reading speed and comprehension that uh, people are still working on. So, you know, that's just another one of those these things about the complexity of the writing system, which uh, also fascinates me. So I think the implication of that is, you know, if you find yourself struggling, ah, just you feel like you can't learn characters or it's really hard, you're just not getting enough exposure. You know, you just need more repetition of characters that, you know, you know or kind of loose in your head and maybe not. So focusing on all those new characters all the time. So, you know, you just got to have enough repetition, enough exposure to the language before they really start to stick. But anyway, I think, though, uh, boiling this down, John, uh, you know, the kind of the first part we're talking about here is characters is, uh, you know, in, I think that uh, Dr. Moser's, you know, his, his criticism, if you will, uh, tongue in cheek of the language, though, it, it, I think is pretty accurate um, because we're bringing up all these different things. And, and what we're talking about makes written Chinese hard. Right? Uh, you don't have all these loan words that are similar to your language. Uh, the writing system, it's not phonetic. There's no alphabet for it. I mean, yeah, there's pinging, but it's not the same. The writing system is just kind of hard. But I think there's some things that when we go into the next things of, of his kind of criticism, some of these things have changed, I would say, a little bit over over the years. And so, uh, I like, John, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because we actually addressed this, I think, in our last two episodes, but he, he says that even looking up a word in a dictionary is complicated. So what do you think is your response to that today? Copy-paste. That's my response. <laughs> Nothing hard about copy-paste. 
Well, his frame of reference, though, was, you know, pre-digital era where, you know, you're looking up things in a paper dictionary. Well, you can't go back to the past. <laughs> I know this is like, you know, stone tablets and stuff right back. Okay, but no, really. John, how long would it take you to look up a character in a paper dictionary? Uh, not that long. You mean by stroke? Whatever. I mean, whatever method. You, you, let's, let's rewind. 15 years ago, you know, you're learning Chinese. You're going, to, you're in grad school at this stage, I think. How long does it take you to look up a character you don't know? Yeah, I was copying and pasting in grad school too. But um, way back in the day, that would have been that would have been I don't know, like a minute for a totally foreign character. Okay, that's not too bad. <laughs> so, so what's your point? <laughs> Takes a minute. <laughs> now it's copy paste. Yeah, now it's copy paste, and it's I mean I think it could be if you have your app open, right? You have Playco open. I mean you you could do it in five fifteen seconds. You could have your character in, right? Yeah. So so a lot of those complexities are being you know uh, alleviated by technology, which is great. Um, doesn't really help you if you're wandering through a temple looking at the walls and trying to read it. But um, Okay, so I, I think enough has been said about um, the characters. We understand what makes them difficult, and we understand that it's going to take a lot of work up front to, to be able to really get into that fantastical world of Chinese characters. Uh, but let's go back to speaking, which I mentioned in the beginning, because we've been talking about characters. So speaking. Um, I think one of the reasons that Chinese gets this reputation for being so hard is that people are trying to do the the phrase book version of Chinese. It's like, I'm going to visit China, uh, you know, pre-COVID, right? I'm going to visit China. Uh, I have this phrase book, and I'm just going to read this stuff, and people are going to understand me, and we'll all have a good time. And they try to read stuff, and the Chinese people are just like, huh? Because uh, <laughs> nothing they read is even remotely intelligible. And so they think, all right, you read it for me, and then I'll read it back, and then it'll be right. And it's like, no, it's just not even close. So I, I think uh, a lot of this nice reputation of Chinese being so hard comes from people who aren't seriously trying to learn it, and they think that they can get by, and they just cannot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, and like, and like my own mother, she's tried to learn Chinese, and, uh, you know, she's not a spring chicken anymore, but she tried, and um, yeah, just... Just does not it just not, does not seem to take because she's not sufficiently motivated, right? But I will say that you know the the pronunciation uh, in Chinese it's it can take quite a bit of getting used to. Uh, there aren't depending on your language of reference. There's there's probably always going to be some sort of comparable sound, uh, like if you're a French, native French speaker or a French speaker that y sound you know like in fish or. Uh, something is similar to the you know the French you know en du toi you know too. So uh, there are some always going to be some things like that. But I know one of the hard pronunciations for English speakers is the X sound, the sh, sh, you know sound, and it's X Q hard time and J. Different. Yeah. There you go. So so there, there's a lot of things like that. It just has a foreign pronunciation, and it takes time for your mouth to get used to that. But John, I I think that the pronunciation thing is almost secondary to tones. I think that is the, probably the thing that really trips up most people who are learning Chinese. Yeah, so tones definitely take some time. And I think it's fair to call them hard unless they, for whatever reason, just click with you right away because some people don't have as much trouble with them. I had a lot of trouble, and uh, I know a lot of people do. Um, one, one thing I'd like to say here is that uh, a lot of people think that they can just do it without getting a lot of input. And it really helps a lot to have, to just hear it a lot. Like you need some kinds of recordings that you can listen to over and over again because your brain just just doesn't want to accept the reality of tones and you just have to beat it into it until it you know really sticks. And so anyone out there, which is probably everyone who's experienced this, when you have tried to speak Chinese to a native and they're like, oh, your Chinese is so good, just don't believe them, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just don't believe it because if your Chinese is really good, they're not going to say anything about it at all. John, when you mm. go speak Chinese to people on the street or somewhere, does anyone comment how good your Chinese is now? Not always, but sometimes. But when they do, the conversation quickly moves on because we actually have other stuff to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Think about this. If you encountered a Chinese person who spoke like near native English... Uh, or near native, whatever your native language is. I mean, how much do you? How much time do you really spend complimenting their English? 
and in really the point is I've I've encountered this right and and it's kind of a little bit like I don't know not demeaning or insulting or anything but it's it's a little bit trite you know if you if you stick on like oh wow your English is just so good well English is like, an international damn. language yeah but I mean you might you may say it but it like he's like John your experiences you quickly move on right. Yeah, it's yeah. not anything you really dwell on. So the point I'm making is someone's like, you know, oh, your Chinese is so good. Just don't believe them. It's like you can appreciate that, but don't inhale it. All right. And uh, and just <laughs> just really realize that your tones still aren't perfect. If you go back and listen to our um, interview from this previous episode, uh, we had a rerun with Chris Max. Uh, he's a YouTuber, but he's popular in the Chinese sphere, and his Chinese is very good. And he talks about this, how he spent many months learning Chinese, really progressed fat quickly, and at some point, a friend of his got honest with him and said, look, all right, your Chinese yeah, it sounds great, but your tones are terrible. They're off. And he's like, what? It was like this huge blow to him. and and But he, he buckled down. He actually got some, like, you know, private feedback from some under them and he's like yeah yeah your tones are actually not that great so he just spent like two months like only working on tones that's it and he had to unlearn some things and and even then you know he's he's i don't know how perfect he is but you know he's definitely going to be you know in the the upper percentile of people who are getting their tones right but it, it's not you need to continue to work on that and that is a huge aspect of learning chinese that makes it so hard yeah, and I think this is something that also relates to that whole comparison issue. Like, if you ever learn Spanish, you have to focus on the pronunciation in the very beginning. But really, you know, you basically get it after a few weeks, and it'll continue to improve, but it's not going to be terrible if you really focus on it in those first few weeks. Whereas Chinese pronunciation, both tones and the consonants and vowels, that is a long-term thing. Like if you can if you can get individually tones correct on your own without hearing them first, that's a milestone. But then to be able to string them together into tone pairs and produce those correctly on the first try without hearing them, that's another milestone. And it's huge. And it's just a long term thing. So tones, yes, Chinese is hard because of tones. And I think that's something that hasn't changed. <laughs> I think that um Compared to, let's say, 20 years ago when this article was first written, uh, I think we have a lot more resources, which are great. Mm. Um, I've even seen some uh, some platforms or apps where they will actually, you know, you say a word and it actually measures your tone or something, uh, you know, the inflection of your voice to say, hey, it's good or bad. And then has lots of different samples you can listen to to try to practice and correct your tones. I mean, we didn't have stuff like that. Or maybe there was 20 years ago, but it was more experimental or, you know, had to be on a computer. It was running some special software. Right. So, so one of the real big issues here is expectations, right? If you understand what's coming and uh, there are a lot more resources out, out there and information, you understand what's coming, then it's not going to be so bad. And you're not going to be like, oh, this is so hard because you're going to know that it's going to take some time. Just like you don't expect to, to pick up piano in an afternoon, you know, you know it's going to take a while and it's going to take practice. And that's the case with Chinese. And um, one thing I like to mention, because um, I think this is helpful to a lot of people, is that with the writing system, uh, Chinese people are fluent when they start learning it, but foreigners are learning everything at the same time. So a lot of people find it really helpful to focus on pronunciation first and, you know, just pinyin and then kind of set the characters aside so you don't have all these front-loaded endeavors like slamming you against the wall repeatedly, you know. Uh, it's good to have a few wins with pronunciation before you jump into characters. That's right. And we did some podcasts specifically about this, you know, like kind of when should I start learning characters? We did a four-part series on that. So you may want to, we'll put a link to those in the show notes and you want to make, maybe if you're, if you're at that stage or I'm just starting out, you know, you, hey, should I start learning characters right away? No, but when should you? Well, you might want to have to go back and listen to that. But I think in general, rule of thumb is when you start having trouble discerning between if, which is it, this shit or that, or that shit, you know? Um, you know, it might be time to really start learning characters. All right, so to wrap up, I want to give you a quote. Jared, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test your nerd cred, all right? Do you recognize all right, all right. it? Tell me what this is from. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. Oh, What's that man. From? Does that sound familiar? It does sound familiar, but I do not know. I can't think of the reference. <laughs> oh, Jared. Okay, that's the Princess Bride. But ah, that's that, yes, that's right. I think before she pushes him down the hill or something. 
uh, yeah, something like that. So yes, yes, yeah. so, you know, as you wish. And he's like, oh, my dear sweet Wesley, and she rolls in after him, and then they fight the Rous's in the swamp of whatever. All right, all you've right. seen the movie, we get it. All right, yes, um, but I want to change that quote to Chinese is hard, guys. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Like the click your way to fluency, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't quite work that way. It's enjoyable though, and you can learn Chinese. Absolutely, you can learn Chinese. John, I want to make my comment on this here is that I think mm. overall, a lot of the things about what David Moser is bringing up, like these are the critical aspects of the language that can make it very difficult. But I think that today, just simply because of the greater number of resources that we have, improvements in technology, it's, it's lessened that gap. The chasm is not as wide as it used to be. And one of the things I'm really grateful about is just how the Chinese language development market is developing and uh, it's improving. And one of the things I have said to different Chinese teachers is simply this, is that because Chinese language pedagogy is coming of age in the technology area, it's benefiting from decades of research into second language acquisition that is filtering itself into the language education faster than it would have been if it was starting to come of age um, maybe about 30, 40 years ago. So we do have that benefit. So I got to say that, and, and that's kind of my perspective on it. Yes, Chinese is hard, uh, but hey, if, if you're learning, if you could pick a time to start learning Chinese, now's the time. Okay, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor is Mandarin Companion. That's right. And today we're talking about our level one book, 300 basic characters, The Monkey's Paw. That's right. This is a classic thriller horror story. It's one of our first Mandarin Companion graded readers. And I, John, I would arguably say one of the easiest ones that we have. Yep, it's, uh, it's a bit shorter. Um, also, little known fact about this story, it is not based on a Simpsons episode. It is based on an actual written short story. <laughs> That's right. With, uh, I, there's the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, I think it was season three or two or something. Anyway, uh, that used this story. But uh, one of the things that makes it so easy is it all takes place in this, the family's home. All right. And they don't even you know, go outside the home or anything. And you only have, I think, uh, four named characters, which mm. makes it even a little simpler. So the plot is a little easier to follow. Um, it's a great book to start out with, to start to read. And uh, the, especially the halfway through the book, it's going to get you turning the pages to find out what happens at the end. Ah, it's freaky. Yeah, it's not easy to write a uh, kind of a thriller story at such a simple level. But uh, this story pulls it off, so definitely check it out. So that's The Monkey's Paw, a Mandarin Companion level one graded reader using only 300 basic characters. You can go out there and get it today. You can find it on Amazon, iBooks, or Kobo, Kindle, or where you get your books. Okay, so Jared, let's do some rants and raves. What do you got? All right, John, I have a rave today. And this rave is on how to do a rant in Chinese. All right, so I came across this. Yes, yes, it's how to do a rant in Chinese. All right, so I came across this on Reddit. And John, you know this, I'm sure, but I had just never run across it. Someone was asking, like, how do you, what's the equivalent of angry all caps in Chinese? And Obviously, you can't do capital letters in Chinese when you're angry. You're like, ah, you know, you listen to me now or something, right? So what do you do? The answer is not right in traditional characters. No, (laughs) that is not. Might confuse some people. But anyway, uh, what you do if you want to write all caps in Chinese is that you pretty much you space out the characters with a period after each one. So it's like, you know, something like that. Um, so that's what you got to do in Chinese is that it's just, you put periods after everything. And then that's the equivalent of like, um, that's the equivalent of just like, you know, shouting in Chinese. This is true. I can verify this. I see this all the time and it is also somewhat visually annoying. So when you overuse it, people get annoyed. Yeah. It, it, obviously if someone's in a chat room or on a chat with you and texting and they're writing all caps, you're probably going to get annoyed with it too. So <laughs> use it sparingly. Um, and, but if you need to. Yell in Chinese? There you go. It's pretty easy. 
Okay, so Jared, uh, following on this topic, I have a rant. And I want to preface this rant by saying it's a little bit petty um, because it's mm. related to English and Chinese uh, friends writing English. But it's because I'm kind of a stickler for like uh, typography and like these little details. But it drives me crazy when my, uh, especially coworkers, Chinese coworkers, they write in English, but they're using the Chinese input. So oh. they can type the letters, yes, but I then guess. the punctuation marks are yes. Chinese. Um, and it's often like just the commas and the parentheses, and there's all this crazy weird space, and the fonts don't match. Oh, it drives me crazy. But but as a, an English speaker, and I've been you know reading for most of my life, I can immediately spot it. But uh, Chinese people, for the most part, don't. They're just not sensitive to it. And yeah. uh, so I understand, but oh, it drives me crazy. I, I'll echo that, man. It drives me nuts as well. And, you know, I have a bakery back there in China. I've done a lot of printing and things in Chinese and in English. And sometimes things come across like with that. I'm like, no, it's the wrong comma. Or it's a period with the circle in it. And it takes like a full character space. And you're like, no, it's wrong. So you have to get that fixed right away. <laughs> yeah, th th this reminds me. I want to do some kind of post or video or something like to help Chinese teachers, to help them understand that like this is actually something a lot of people care about, even if it seems like ridiculous. It just it's just somehow infuriating, right? So you're now going to micromanage all your Chinese teachers? I'm going to help them improve in all ways, including punctuation. Just watch out so they don't punctuate you. So my name is Sarah Kudalakos. My Chinese name is Gao Shi Ru, Tang Shi De Shi Ru De Ru. I currently am the executive director of the Canada China Business Council based in Toronto. Sarah's story is a great example of how our motivations and interests can shape our careers and life. I especially appreciate how she found ways to employ her Chinese throughout her life, despite not always being in Chinese speaking environments. I'm sure you'll enjoy her fascinating journey. Stay with us. Why did you start learning Chinese? So I was an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin-Madison studying international business. And I wanted a language that was harder than Spanish. Spanish had been too easy in high school. I kind of joke that in 1986, I flipped a coin between Japanese and Chinese. And at that point, Japanese was really popular in the 80s. And I chose Chinese partly because we were supposed to be able to do all of second year on a summer program where they did five weeks in Taipei and five weeks in Beijing. And I thought, okay, that is what I want to do. Wow, that's cool. No, so you, did you literally flip a coin? I did not literally flip a coin. No, it was sort of a proverbial coin flip. I asked that because we actually had a guest who she flipped the coin. It's Terry Waltz. I'll put the link in the show notes. But yeah, it, she literally okay. flipped a coin and it came up Chinese. And so that's what she did. Oh, that's funny. So I studied something like 43 credits of Chinese by the time I was done. It didn't end up being enough even to get a minor. I would have had to spend a sixth year in college to do history and geography. So I bagged that and I said, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've, I've had a, basically four years of Chinese. I'm good. But I did end up spending a lot of time in Taiwan during university and got my Chinese up to a pretty good level. So I was able to, when I was done, buy a one-way ticket and move to Taiwan and take my chances on what kind of career I could have there. What were some of the things that you did that you think were like really made a big impact on your Chinese proficiency? So when I started in first-year Chinese, the... University of Wisconsin actually had the best undergrad education program in Chinese in the U.S. We were really lucky. We had a professor who had created his own textbooks and a really good system where it was basically double the amount of credits of any other class. So I think we had three hours a week of lecture, six hours a week with TAs, and then we had to go to the language lab. Mm. And at that point, we were still on cassette tapes. So we oh. would go take out cassette tapes. And I remember doing... 14 hours a week sometimes with cassettes and we would sit there and the other thing that this program did that was really good is they started us off on traditional characters and the Taiwanese phoneticization 
And so we would sit there with the tapes and we would go boar, poor, more, for. And I remember I would get to the symbol for art and I would just burst out laughing in my dorm room because of the sound. You know, there were such <laughs> crazy sounds, sounds we had never thought of. And we weren't allowed to even read Pinin until third year. Really? Uh, because they wanted us to really understand the sounds and how they worked. So Pinin and simplified characters didn't come into play until third year, at which point that was a five-credit course per semester instead of a six-credit course. And then I think fourth year was like a three-credit course. So we really got a lot of Chinese kind of stuffed into us. So I need to clarify that. I'll make sure I got it right. So you didn't learn Pinin until what, like, later on, I think you said year three? Year three. I mean, were you using just the Juying and the Bopo Mofo? Yeah. And a lot of listeners are not going to be familiar with that. Maybe you just... Tell a little bit what that is. It's kind of like pinyin, so it makes essentially the same sounds, but it uses other symbols. So you don't run the risk of equating the symbol with a sound in your own vocabulary. You know, a lot of people mess up the X's and the Q's and stuff in pinyin, but in the Zhuing Fu Hao, it really is the phonetic symbols for the sounds that you're making. So you did learn a romanization, but you just weren't introduced to pinyin until later on. But like, what were your motivations, though, Sarah? I mean, a lot of people learn Chinese, but not everyone decides, hey, I'm just going to move to the country and I'm just going <laughs> to see what I can do there. So by the time I really moved there after college, I had had two experiences living there. And that first year of studying and then about six months of living in Taiwan, and you realize how hooked you get on the fact that the culture and the language and the history and everything are so intertwined. And it was such an interesting place to live. And it took me about 10 years into my career before I really even made it into mainland China. Because there, you needed an official program. And, you know, China at that point in the late 80s was still in a very different state. But Taiwan was easy. You got a visa. You went over there. You could teach English and earn good, good money. And so the first summer, I taught English at a language school and then took some Chinese on the side. The second summer I went back, because it was a lot better money than working at Walmart or whatever else a sophomore in college could have done. And at that point, it was clear how easy it was to piece together interesting jobs. My best job was that summer, I was a counter girl at the Sunrise Department Store. So I got to wear this like Shirley Temple dress, (laughs) and my job was to sit at the visitor desk for two hours a day to welcome all the foreign customers. Wow. And there were none. Wow. Or very few. And two hours a day, I had to sit in the basement in the broadcast booth. And so, like, first, the Chinese colleague would say, Mian bao chu lu la. And I would say, fresh bread has emerged from the oven. Please join us in the bakery. (laughs) And so I had to make a few of those announcements every day. But... Basically, I got to sit and listen to 20-year-old Chinese girls speak to me every day. And I learned so much, you know, not just vocabulary, but I remember one, she was really patient with me on making any sound with an oo in it, like, you know, oo or chu, mm. anything with that where you need it around your lips. And we don't round our lips speaking English. And so, you know, learning things like that was really huge for me. And we learned things like, how to get the most out of your, uh, you know, Laobao health insurance so you could go to the dentist more often. Or there were lots of conversations between all the girls about, ah, oh, do I have, you know, shuang yan pi or dan yan pi, you know, the double eyelid, and should they mm-hmm. go into plastic surgery for it? These were not things we learned in Chinese class. <laughs> yeah, the repertoire that we're taught in, you know, textbooks and class can be quite limited. But, I mean, it sounds like that was an excellent opportunity to, like, be immersed and get real interaction with the language. Yeah, it really was. And it was really after the second summer. During the second summer, I realized I actually had enough vocabulary that I could tell a taxi driver where I wanted to go. That first year, I mean, because often people ask me, well, how long did you have to study before you could really use it? That first summer, we couldn't do much. Like, we were trying to negotiate with our landlord. We had eight foreigners all living in an apartment together. And we had to, like, negotiate whether or not there were beds in the contract, like was the place furnished. And, you know, I remember not knowing how to say mattress or things like that. So we had to rely on a couple of classmates that were a year ahead of us to make sure we we knew where we were living. And we had no phone 
for a month or two. It took six weeks to get a fridge. And at that point, you know, phone systems were very, very different. So while we were waiting for our phone system to get installed, we were looking for English teaching jobs. So we would go to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial and we would go there to use the payphone. So the job search was always, don't call me, I'll call you. And then we would go there to get cold water from the uh, drinking fountain. And we would also go running. And I remember thinking, what must my lungs look like? Because at that point, Taiwan was a pretty polluted place. Wow, wow. I love hearing these stories, too, because, uh, you know, it's contrasting to nowadays. You know, we got Placo, dictionaries, there's Google Translate if you need it, things like that. But, I mean, then, I mean, you didn't know how to say what you needed to say. I mean, what did you do? So you had to fall back on things you could control. Like I remember we didn't have money to take taxis. I never took a taxi when I was a student. So you had to take the bus. But all of the bus stops were named not after the streets they were on, but in Taipei they named the bus stops after something in the area, you know, number four girls school or XYZ Mm. hospital. And so impossible to know. So I bought a one-speed beater bike, and I rode around Taipei on it. I was, you know, literally no self-respecting person in Taiwan who wasn't a crazy foreigner was going to ride a bike (laughs) at that point. But that was all we could (laughs) afford. So we would ride there. Remember, we would wear these white T-shirts, and we'd get home. And first of all, we had these little masks, and the masks would turn black. And I'd thank my lucky stars I was still alive, having survived the traffic, and I would wipe my brow on the sleeve of my white T-shirt, and it would turn black. Oh, man. So pollution was really bad then. It was really bad. It has improved so much. Well, what made that transition for you where you said, hey, I want to get to the mainland? So the job that I took after college, I worked for a computer company. It still exists. It's one of Taiwan's biggest companies now, Transcend Information Inc. So I did that for a couple of years. Even then, you know, I'd have a week off and I'd say, oh, I really have to get to the mainland. And it was hard to do it justice, right? There's just so much going on in mainland China. So finally, I had ended up being back in the States. I did an MBA. And it was unclear whether or not my job post-MBA was going to bring me to China as I wanted to. So I remember taking my first trip on a little vacation I took after I graduated. But I got really lucky, and I took a job with Kodak, which at the time was in the midst of making a very big investment in China. In fact, in the mid-'90s, we invested a billion dollars and were allowed, at a time when photography stopped being a restricted industry, we were allowed to be the first foreign company to put greenfield factories in place and to sell film domestically. Because until that time, you could buy Kodak and Fuji and Konica film in China, but it all came in via gray channels from Hong Kong. It was one of those crazy anomalies where we were allowed to service our product in China, but not to sell it. It was interesting to see my colleagues who put in the time to learn and who didn't, because it's really busy being an expat in China. But the ones who did try to put in that extra effort, you know, it really yielded benefits for them. But it's hard when you're an adult with a job to study Chinese. It's why I I feel very fortunate that I started so early. What's it like for people who have those China-facing jobs for the people who speak Chinese versus those who don't? So I think it is very possible to do well in China without speaking Chinese. I've met many business people who do, and it tends to be those who have the most emotional intelligence. Yeah, I was just talking to a, a CEO of a company who you know lived there for 20 years, and he said it, he thought it was really his soft skills, his patience, his interest in understanding people that helped him. But if you know the language, then you can go to a different level. And I often find that when I'm talking to people, being able to speak to them in Chinese and to hold a meeting in Chinese or to not have to be helped all the time by others in terms of having an interpreter, it just takes you to a whole different level. And having the fluency can often generate a certain amount of respect up front that lets you then dig in and develop a relationship. Can you think of an example or a story like that? I mean, I've had teams in China where if we'd been operating all in English, they would not have opened up and talked to me about problems or challenges. But because we were able to do the interactions in Mandarin, the problems surfaced earlier. The other thing about speaking Chinese is you learn very quickly how a high context culture like China works versus a low-context culture. Maybe you could tell us what you mean by the high-context or low-context. 
Countries like China or Japan are high context. Much of the meaning comes out not in what is said, but in how it is said or other forms of expression. Whereas we Americans, we are very into a low context culture. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And so because we're so direct, it's often easy to miss cues from someone in a high context culture. I always give this example of one of the senior leaders we had at Kodak. He had this concept called putting the dead fish on the table. He said, in an environment like ours, if something's not going well, you have to speak up, you know, and if it's like a dead fish under the table, it just festers. You have to put it on the table. I always jokingly say that in China, you will find dead fish on the table, but only in the middle of a banquet. But <laughs> your Chinese counterparts will not necessarily tell you what they want. And I learned this the hard way. So when I was in Taiwan, I was working for this startup computer company. The boss had been a former engineer at Hewlett Packard. He was very westernized and he and I got along really well. I was able to tell him what I thought and he thought so highly of what I was doing that he actually sent me to go work in our Los Angeles office. And while I was there staying in the company apartment, the boss's brother came and joined us there. And there were people in and out of the company apartment all the time. But this guy was a very traditional businessman from the construction industry in Taiwan. Mm. So while his brother was kind of a suave computer nerd, this guy had a crew cut and was quite coarse. And I didn't understand the communication differences with a guy like this. So we ended up having to live in the same apartment in LA. And I did terrible, terrible things like suggested that we recycle paper in the office. (laughs) <laughs> and ask him to smoke on the balcony of our apartment in LA. And so it turns out that every night he was on to the phone with on the phone to his brother in Taiwan saying, "Who's this terrible foreigner that you hired? You know, she's awful. We don't like her." And what I didn't understand is that the first time somebody is not happy with you, they keep it inside. And the second time, they probably still keep it inside. And the third time, they might finally tell somebody else. And if you're lucky, it gets back to you. So I learned how to turn my radar way, way up. And back to your original question, I think in a any situation when you're dealing with China, knowing that you have to remind yourself to keep that radar up is a crucial part of it. And you can do that if you don't speak a word of Chinese, but it's even easier when you do. Well, it sounds like your career is kind of taking a little bit between China. So like, how are you still using Chinese in your everyday life? Or are you? So I am. So I'm an American who ended up moving to Toronto 20 years ago. I'm married to a guy from Greece. So my husband said, okay, when we have kids, I'm going to speak Greek to them. You should speak Chinese to them. And I thought, huh, that's an interesting idea. So I agreed. Why not, right? What have we got to lose? And the very first day I had with my first child, I was like, okay, what am I supposed to say? But (laughs) you sort of, you get used to it, right? And so I have never spoken anything but Chinese to my two children. And when we had the second daughter, the first daughter agreed that they would speak Chinese amongst themselves, which was, is really quite amazing because unlike a lot of, overseas Chinese families that I see where the kids refuse to speak Chinese, my kids have never refused to speak Chinese to me. Wow. They complain about me sending them to Chinese class so that they can learn how to write and read. But, you know, they fight in Chinese. You know, we used to hear Ben Dan all day long. They would just, you know, (laughs) yell at each other. And what I didn't realize was how much that was going to help my own comprehension. And it wasn't because I was learning, you know, new, complicated stuff, but I was using it all the time. And I remember, so this was in 2001 that we started doing this. And in 2004, we moved to Beijing for a year. And I remember listening to the radio and thinking, hey, I understand what's on the radio. I didn't used to understand the radio. And I I chalked it up Mm. to just that sort of constant use of the language. And now, of course, with podcasts and online learning tools, and I mean, you guys have some stuff that sounds really interesting. It's a whole lot easier to keep that up. But I do definitely encourage Chinese speakers to create their own little Chinese speakers. It's a a really helpful tool. Wow, that is great. I got to know, like when you're speaking to your kids, because, you know, I speak to my kids in Chinese, not all the time, but there's some times where we definitely lie 
on an English word that maybe I don't know or a name, you know, or a city or something. What, what do you do in those instances? So if I don't know the word, then I will sometimes throw in the English word or I try to describe it first before I would use the word. Sometimes we'll be like, hey, let's open Pleco and see what that word is. And there are definitely realms of life that I'm not going to be able to speak very well about in Chinese, but that's okay. And I learned that as long as you try, you know, you got like a good 50% chance of being right. So often I would just guess. So I didn't have enough Chinese books for my kids when they were small, but I would read to them every night. So I would just translate on the fly. You know, I was looking for Chinese versions of my favorite books like Dr. Seuss or things like that. And for a long time, I couldn't find anything. And so I didn't read my children Dr. Seuss for the longest time. And I thought, what a shame this is. I really need to figure this out. And then I looked at a Dr. Seuss book and I said, you know what? Half the words in this book are made up English words. So I'm going to make up the Chinese word. <laughs> and it worked. Wow. Thanks for sharing that experience. Because, I mean, you, we've just been doing some surveys here at Manor Companion recently. And one of the things we found, that what's the biggest challenge about learning Chinese? People are like, I don't have anyone to speak to. Well, it sounds like that's not your problem unless they get old and move out, right? Exactly. Well, and, you know, I have a colleague I work with here up in Canada who had a pretty good level of Chinese, and he's really motivated himself to keep going with teachers. And during the pandemic, when he was basically holed up in a cabin and, you know, working eight hours a day, but not having any sort of life outside, he contacted us and he said, hey, I have a bunch of language exchanges going on and I, I want to do some more. So he was doing like three or four language exchanges where he would talk to these friends in China a couple times a week and they would have specific things they wanted to talk about. And it's amazing to me how diligent he has been able to be as a working executive to keep up his Chinese. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, Sarah, now you're working for the Canada-China Business Council. And obviously you're interacting with China, but how does Chinese still important to your career? And are you using it with your job and with your career? So the CCBC is a bilateral business council. And our goal is to help more and better business happen between Canada and China. So we're helping Canadian companies to do business in and with China. So I have the opportunity to speak quite often with members, whether they might be Chinese companies. When we could travel, there were often a lot of incoming delegations and things like that. And about half my team is of Chinese origin. And one of the things I realized after I started this job is we got a few months in and I remember some delegation coming from, I don't know, Liaoning or somewhere. And I realized that I was stumbling over words and I thought, hey, I'm forgetting my Chinese. But wait a minute, I run this company. So maybe I can make us speak Chinese. So we actually made a deal and Tuesdays and Thursdays would be Chinese day at the office and Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be English days. So that worked pretty well. During the pandemic, that's been a bit tougher. And of course, when I go to China, I try to use it all I can. And the other thing I've done in this role is done a lot more public speaking in Chinese. And it was so scary at the beginning. I remember just shaking there up on stage. But that's <laughs> another thing that I think is really good in terms of challenging yourself and understanding how to say things more smoothly. Also understanding how different the language you use on a stage is. Like, I still stumble a lot on the real formal stuff. Like, if I say to a colleague, you know, write me up something I should say as an MC, and they write words that I wouldn't ordinarily use, mm. much harder than if I do it in a much more conversational way with language I'm comfortable with. Something I think from your perspective, I'd like to hear, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are just learning Chinese right now. They're in their 20s. They're still figuring out what they want to do in life. And some people, you know, they saw that question of like, do I really need to learn Chinese? Or really, what kind of opportunities are out there for someone who does speak Chinese as opposed to, you know, translating or something? So what do you see from your perspective? I obviously think speaking Chinese is important, given that I've invested so much time and energy in it. But if you want to do business with what is arguably one of the most important countries in the world, 
understanding it is important. And language is a key part of understanding China. And so even if you don't end up using it in your day job, you might still be able to incorporate that into your career in some way. The thing that I learned very early on was that the language isn't enough. It's, what do they say, necessary but not sufficient. And I remember trying to wrangle an assignment in Beijing back in 2004, and I was talking to different people in different divisions at Kodak and ended up getting a role that would send me there for a year. And I brought up something about my language skills, and the woman I was reporting to said, oh, in the end, I don't really care that you speak Chinese. She said, it's very nice, but I care that you know how to bring a product to market. So I always tell people that, you need to figure out what your functional skill is and be good at it. And, you know, if you want to be a Chinese teacher, for example, then maybe your functional skill is speaking Chinese. But if you want to go do marketing or brand management or work in business or public relations, even, you know, government, there has to be those other skills as well. That's great advice. Having a skill and Chinese complementing that, that sounds like a very powerful combination. And the other thing I would say is people say, well, if I learn the language, you know, can I get a job in China? And obviously things change over time. I talked about Taiwan in the late 80s and early 90s when you could go and do anything. I think there was a period over the last 10 or 15 years in mainland China where it was kind of like that, you know, the go-go days. It's maybe a little bit harder now, but Like somebody was just telling me the other day how right now, if you're in China and you can teach English, you could make a ton of money because there aren't enough people who are doing it and who are willing to go to China. Obviously, COVID is a barrier to getting there, but that's often a great way to start. And when I got this job in the computer industry and I had bought this one-way ticket to Taiwan, I said, well, the worst that'll happen is I'll teach English again. I know I can do it. And then I ended up finding a job more in the area of my study. And so it's often a good way to get your feet wet. Sarah, I'm assuming you've been in and out of China. You've traveled around. Like, How has traveling played a part in you understanding China and Chinese? So we've tried really hard to go to very unusual and interesting places in China. I visited Xinjiang, for example, in the year 2000. So I saw it in a very different state than it was today. But it gives me a basis on which to understand some of the, you know, more controversial stuff that's happening now. But during our periods where we lived in China, as you know, China has these things called golden weeks, where the whole country gets a week off. So our goal was to travel during golden weeks to places in China without Chinese tourists. Good luck. Well, it turns out it's possible. So like we went to Inner Mongolia where we went camping in a forest and, you know, ended up being able to stay on the lawn of a Inner Mongolian family who lived in a yurt. Or, you know, we found these crazy sand dunes that you could drive over. Wow. And then during another golden week, we went to the Nujiang Valley of Yunnan. You know, in Western Yunnan, there's a road that basically starts in the south and goes up to the north. And from the north, you can only walk then if you want to go somewhere else. And it's filled with Tibetan Catholics. Really? And so we had this guide who was kind of an ecotourism legend who was trying to get, you know, conservation and things built into Yunnan. But he took us on a hike. We were supposed to camp but it was raining too hard. So we walked up, I don't know, we walked for probably three or four hours, and he ended up putting us up in his sister's house. Wow. Which, first of all, they had kids who were going to school in the village nearby. And I had a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old who were complaining all the way about how long this was taking. And (laughs) kids their same age walk every week four hours down to go to boarding school in the village. So this was a great example of the poverty alleviation efforts that were going on and how they were moving people into the cities or giving them schooling there. And the funniest thing was we went to the house that we stayed in and they were cooking and they had us like help to stir the pot. And the first thing that we looked at that they were cooking, it looked like a really delicious soup. And I said, ah, so what are we eating? And they go, oh, no, 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 this isn't for you. First, we feed the pigs. And so that was what they were cooking for the pigs, which were very important (laughs) to them. And then they cooked for the people. 
So anyway, you know, just being able to learn about those things. And it's not that you go to a show and they're wearing ethnic costumes and dancing for you. You're really digging in and understanding. That was, I think, really, really fun. Really what it comes down to, you know, you think again about the language. The language helps you understand the people. And China is not what the media makes of it, which is the government and the party. China is all about people. And being able to communicate with people and understand them helps you understand how we're not that different from each other. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah. China, 1.4 billion people. They can't all be monolithic. Exactly, exactly. Well, Sarah, if you could go back and you could do any part of your experience differently, what would you do differently? I would, if I could, my life didn't end up working out this way, but I would try to live in China for a longer period of time continuously. I think I would have had a different career if I had been based there versus traveling back and forth or only going for a year at a time. And what kind of advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese right now or just starting out? The first thing I always say is, open your mind completely. Pretend you're like in kindergarten and give up all your notions of how you have studied other languages. Because if you're open to these different sounds and the different way things come together, Chinese is a very easy language in many ways. You know, it has its complexities, but like the grammar, I mean, I tried studying Japanese while I was studying Chinese and I was like, what? You want me to conjugate all those things and give me three alphabets? Mm. And then I started studying Greek when I married my husband, and they even conjugate nouns. And my Chinese grammar sensibility says, why would you bother to do that? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some of those easier aspects of the Chinese language. Easy, right? Yes. And, you know, one of the things that I have really tried to do is to keep connecting with things I understand. So when I had time to read more, I would, like, find the books that were published that corresponded with movies. Remember the movie Face Off with Nicolas Cage? I remember watching that movie and then getting the book for it in Chinese. Our last book, Jekyll and Hyde, the cover of that book is based off of the uh, movie poster for Face Off. Side note. Yeah, because I just find that one of the tough things about reading is you're looking up a character and then you realize it's somebody's name and you've wasted that time. So if you know the character names and the general premise, it's easier to get through things faster. Another thing I've found recently that I really like is Xiao Sheng Xuanhua, I think is the Chinese. Uh, I think it's called Loud Murmurs. I think it's actually edited by Josh, the guy that does Mandarin Slang Guide, which is another really fun site. But in Loud Murmurs, it's these three or four female hosts who are either living in the U.S. or have lived there, and they talk about cultural things that are happening in Western culture. So like Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, and they did a whole episode on RBG. You know, the Oscars mm. came out, and they talked about the movies from the Oscars. So these are things that I am inherently understanding because I'm reading about them in my own language. So then to hear people talk about them in Chinese, it's been really amazing to follow. And I find that I'm able to keep up, and I'm often learning some new sort of turns of phrase that I wouldn't have known. For example, a character in a movie, I had always learned it as 主角, like 男主角, like the main male character. And then I, I realized, I thought, but geez, did I learn this wrong? Did I forget this wrong? Because people were calling it 主角. And it turns out that's the mainland way of saying it. Oh. So these hosts on Loud Murmurs, who are mostly from the mainland, they've had this like film professor come on who's from Taiwan, and the hosts are saying Zhu Jie, and the professor is saying Zhu Jiao. And I'm like, ah, so I did learn it right. But you realize how those things can sort of just coexist. But those are nuances that you won't pick up unless you have a chance to listen to it more often, right? Sarah, something I like that you're talking about here, and I think is relevant for anyone listening is that you're talking about you're still learning, right? I am. And, and, and that's one of the things about Chinese. It's like, you're still learning. You've been studying for decades. You've been learning for decades. You have a high level of proficiency in the language, but you know, you're still learning. 
Yeah, and it'll never stop. I keep thinking when my kids grow up, maybe then I'll have time to sit down and really be able to read better, you know, to not have to rely on others to translate stuff for me that's written. Because I can read and write, but it takes a lot of time. You have to put your attention where it does you the most good. So yeah, I, I don't think I'll ever stop. Well, Sarah, I appreciate you sharing all of these insights. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us on this podcast. Thank you, Jared. It's been really great to talk to you. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, movers, shakers, sailor, lifter, swimmer, tailor, mailer, bailer, whaler, retailer, and that one guy towing a trailer named Zachary Taylor. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mannercompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is Kaiser Kuo at Sub China. And our interview editor is James Harper with Filter Production. I'd like to thank our guest, Sarah Kudalakos, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paston. See you next time.